Volunteering is giving. Sharing, standing by others, supporting causes you care about, and creating a better future for everyone. This is why more and more entities support volunteering to achieve the sustainable development goals. Volunteers make a difference to the lives of many. Join us and become a United Nations volunteer. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, to all participants. We, we would like to welcome um, and you're joining this one UN live chat event uh, talking about talent in the United Nations, be it from the LinkedIn live channel of the United Nations volunteers or, or from other live channels from other UN organizations, uh, YouTube channels in particular. My name is Jean-Luc Marcelin, and I work with the United Nations Development Programme, UNDP, as an outreach officer. And it is my great pleasure to be with you today and moderate this panel discussion and a Q&A session, which will be focusing on today the STEAM, the science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics profiles. Um, it's uh, today's event is part of a series of, of live events where we as one UN try to explore various employment and career paths which uh, you as talent may be interested in. There are many different UN organizations and agencies with many different talent needs, expertise needs. Um, and as a matter of fact, we have backstage uh, several colleagues from other agencies who are there to support also the questions and answers backstage, as I was saying. But all in all, despite all these needs, as one UN, we, more and we first and foremost need talents like you. So today, once again, we will be focusing on STEAM talent, uh, science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics. To discuss with us today, I'm very happy to welcome three panelists from three different UN agencies. Allow me just to name them and they will, we will have the pleasure to hear a bit more about their background in, in a couple of minutes. So first of all, I would like to welcome Ms. Muna Albana, who's the Regional Infrastructure Advisor for the Middle East with the United Nations Office for Project Services, the UNOPS. Welcome, Muna. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Indeed, and the same, the same with us. Uh, we also have Ms. Ilam Ghazi, who's the head of the Broadcasting Services Division at the Radio Communication Bureau of the International Telecommunication Union, the ITU. A warm welcome to you as well, Ilam. Thank you very much. Very pleased and honored to be here today. Likewise, really. And last but not least, we have uh, Ms. Jody Miller, who is the section head of the isotope hydrology at the International Atomic Energy Agencies, the IAEA. A warm welcome to you as well, Jody. Thank you very much, Anouk. I'm glad to be here and happy to talk about this very important topic. Wonderful. Um, just before starting this panel discussion, just to mention to all participants and welcome them once again, that we will have two sequences in this uh, in this uh, today's uh, um, session. We will have the uh, uh, panel discussion where some questions will be asked to all three panelists. Sorry, Muna, would you mind muting your mic just to uh, thank you. Uh, to, to all three panelists uh, to hear a bit more about their background and also some tips and advice that they may have for you, talent, interested in that STEAM uh, field of expertise. And then we will take uh, for the last 20 minutes or so uh, some questions and answers, which will be channeled through uh, the chats of the various um, um, uh, platforms you're, you're, you're watching this webinar from. So again, feel free to ask your questions on the chat, uh, ask away, and then my colleagues will, will curate them and, and, and then we will try to answer a few of these questions uh, within the imparted time. We will be together for around 40 more minutes. All right. So without further ado, let's jump into the panel discussion. And I'm going to ask, first of all, to all to our, our three panelists, a bit of a, an, an opening question, a bit of a general question regarding your background. Tell us a bit about yourself, your professional background, 
um, and, and what kind of work do you do and, and where, how did that lead, uh, how did your, your background lead to your, your current functions in your respective UN agencies? Shall we start maybe with, with you, Muna? Over to you. Thank you so much for this. Uh, I have uh, a PhD and a master's degree in environmental engineering and a bachelor degree in civil engineering. I'm also a project management professional, PMP, certified PMP, as well as I am a member of the Professional Engineering of Ontario. I have graduated in civil engineering in 1985. Starting my professional ex experience in the field in Jordan and South Africa, I got my 20 years of experience in the field of construction, design, engineering design, and project management. Moving to Canada after that 20 years, I have changed my pathway to research and back to academia for my advanced studies. Here, I would like to mention that between my master degree and my bachelor degree, I have 20 years. And I just want to take this as a motivation for all of you that it's never too late. And we can really uh, uh, go back to have advanced degrees and continue our profession. After I, wor I have worked with in the academia for more than 10 years in Canada and in Jordan, I moved back, uh, I started my career at the UN as a multi-sectorial engineering specialist with UNDP Iraq, where I have worked for almost five years. And I started my profession at UNOPS in 2013 as the Middle East Regional Infrastructure Advisor, where I have worked in Jordan, Iraq, Yemen, uh, Jerusalem, um, and Syria, Lebanon, and other countries in the Middle East. Thank you. Unmuting myself. Thank you so much for this introduction, Muna, and, and we will hear more about uh, about you a, a bit later indeed. Uh, may I ask maybe, um, um, sh shall we say, uh, Il Ilam, would you like to, to take up this, uh, this question as well, please? Absolutely, and with big pleasure. So um, I graduated in 95, I think the same year as Muna, uh, from the Civil Aviation University in Kiev, Ukraine. I am from Morocco, so uh, I finished with the engineering degree, master. I came back to Morocco, and this is not in my CV anywhere. I was jobless for six months. And during this period, I tried to do some trainings in the field and also improved uh, my English in Morocco. And then I had the opportunity to work in the Ministry of Telecommunications uh, for almost two years. And then we had the uh, liberalization of the sector, the telecommunication sector, and we had the creation, as everywhere in the world, of the um, Agency for Regulations. And I was chosen to go there. And there I started having um, different responsibility. Then my first responsibility as um, a project manager for spectrum management uh, system. And then I was uh, promoted horizontally, but I never refused. I was very happy to diversify and to accumulate. And that's why then I was the head of the unit of uh, frequency planning and then international coordination, where I uh, met the ITU, the international community. I was participating in conferences and then very quickly I was asked to chair some small uh, groups and then uh, bigger, etc. So this is how I, I, I met the ITU. And in 2005, there was an, a job um, vacancy. I submitted and I was, um, I was uh, taken and I started in 2005, very briefly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your background, Hilam. And, and now, if I may ask also Jody to, to jump in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, so I'm going to start a slightly different position because when I was a young girl, I didn't actually, or I don't recall having an ambition to be anything in particular. What I wanted was to do a PhD, even from when I was very young. My, my mother had been a secretary. She wanted more for her children. So um, after a number of years, obviously, I, I got my PhD. And then I realized at the end of my PhD that I needed to get a job. Um, 
And uh, an offer came uh, my way to move to South Africa. I got my PhD from Monash University in Australia. Um, and then I was offered a postdoc in South Africa. Um, so I moved to South Africa and I uh, spent the next 20 years working in higher education in South Africa. And one of the things that I saw there is the really important need for strong uh, female role models for students coming through the university system. Um, and so then, then my goal became to become a professor. Um, and once I became a professor, um, which took a long time, I must admit, uh, there was a few hurdles along the way. Um, but once I became a professor, I started to look for other opportunities. And funnily enough, just at that time, I was approached by the International Atomic Energy Agency and encouraged to apply for the position of section head. Um, and like a lot of um, senior female scientists, my initial response was, oh, well, they'll never appoint me. But one of my friends said, why don't you apply? It's just a useful experience. Um, and I made the first cut and then I made the second cut. And then suddenly it seemed like it was serious. And I emailed um, the contact at the agency and I said, should I? be discussing this with my family? And they said, yes. Um, and yeah, and they offered me the job. And so that's how I've now ended up at the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is a position that I really love and gives me an opportunity to um, do even more in the role of um, being a leader for women in science. Thank you, thank you, Jody. Very, very inspirational indeed, and and um, and I like also the element you're mentioning of the bit the, the happenstance that you were not really planning, but but that's how it ended up, and and for the better for you and for and for women and and development, of course. So thank you so much for this. Actually, this leads me to uh, um, another question, maybe that I could ask uh, to um, let's say Ilam. Uh, which is a bit, a bit similar in the sense of how did you first start your career in the UN system? What, what, made, what made the trigger and why the UN system and not, and not another aid, uh, entity somehow? Ilan. Thank you very much for this question, um, which was, I mean, starting in the, uh, the ITU was a complete change in my career and in my life. And as Judy so well said, I mean, when I saw the job, uh, description, I thought, oh my God, this is completely for me. But then, oh my God, I will never have it. And, uh, you know, uh, for Morocco, uh, the idea is really, it's only for developing countries, and etc. Uh, Morocco is a developing country, so I, I didn't feel I had all the chances, but still, I thought, okay, let me do it. So I took the time I filled in, etc. But as I said, before that, um, also participating in conferences and when I asked to do a small group, uh, chair a small group, afternoon group, etc. I never refused. I was always, uh, an opportunity comes, I take it and I will work very hard, uh, um, seek help if needed, etc. But uh, not refuse or say, no, I cannot do it. But the, the, the opposite. And I think this is a very important message also. And, and then I, I, I was I was taken and uh, I started very, I mean, I started um, uh, as a simple uh, engineer, and then working again hard, and uh, I, I was lucky to to um, uh, to um, to evolve in this family that I was loving even before joining the ITU. While I was going to the conferences, being there, uh, this multicultural, these people from all around from the very simple people while uh, they looked to me, I was very young, they looked to me all like geniuses, etc. And it was, wow, that would be really great to, to, to work with these people. And, and then it happened. It happened because of, as I said, it's accumulation of experiences. It's, it's to be open to all learning and to be all the time in a learning process and opportunity working hard but also uh, I mean not killing ourselves in the job and this is also um, a good marriage in, in you that we can uh, afford having um, I mean private life and do activities I, I started piano lessons uh, four years ago and uh, it's never late for anything so we can live travel a lot how our lives and also evolve in, in this um, magnificent multicultural dimension I would say Thank you, thank you, Ilham, and, and and indeed, I mean, the multicultural aspect, among other many things you've just you just said, is is very true when when joining the UN, and and we we are a good 
example of this uh, in this in this panel discussion. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to turn my head to uh, to, to to Muna again and, and and discuss a little bit more or ask you a little bit more about um, your background. I mean, you have a very um, extensive background in in, in engineering, uh, construction management, infrastructure design, and it's and, and so many other elements that you briefly highlighted. How does your background? How is your background? Sorry, useful uh, for steam types of positions in the UN system, or maybe in your agency, UNOPS, as you prefer. But how do you relate your, your background with the type of jobs the UN is looking for? Yes. Thank you so much for this. Uh, UNOPS is mandated in infrastructure, project management, and procurement. And uh, during my uh, work since uh, with UNOPS since 2000, 2000, 2013, we, uh, my colleagues at HQ and in the region, and myself, we have designed, implemented, and successfully handed over many projects and in infrastructure. These projects serve the local communities as well as the refugees in this region, in the Middle East region, as you know. The, the support was uh, for these communities to get better infrastructure that services in water and sanitation, schools, hospitals, roads, uh, and many others, including uh, sources of energy. Uh, of course, uh, my, uh, uh, during uh, our, our works, we always are keen to add value and in innovation, sustainability, improved operations and maintenance. And we look at integrated services and infrastructure. So if we are implementing a project uh, to the local communities or to the camps, uh, let's say water and sanitation, we think always about uh, these integrated services. So for example, this water and sanitation, will it serve also schools and hospitals and clinics and others? We uh, uh, provided uh, many clinics and hospitals with renewable energy resources, such as photovoltaics that will serve, for example, the uh, uh, emergency units, the diabetes units, and so on. We think about innovation even in building roads, for example, adding the solar lights to the roads. Uh, designing better roads uh, 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 at the entrances of the hospital, uh, of the cities, and so on. We also think about maintenance and operation. We don't think about designing the infrastructure unit itself as a unit, but we always think about how we can integrate these services into the communities themselves. We think about gender, we think about women and infrastructure. We think about uh, 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 optimization of resources. It's not only just designing the project and sub providing it to the community, but also how can we provide better uh, quality of material using, uh, for example, the local communities, for example, in building roads. We don't think about, for example, outsource of the gravel and the asphalt, but we use it from the local community itself. When we, paint, when we do the painting for schools, we think about the best uh, paint that can be maintained and with the lowest volatiles. Also, my experience in environmental engineering helped me to think about uh, climate change, adaptation and mitigation. Uh, we think about the drought and especially in the Middle East, because you know the region is suffering from drought for uh, some uh, longer years. So these are the things that, from my experience, I used in order to uh, design better projects, as, uh, adding value. We are a UN organization. Without adding value to the communities, then what did we do? So these things that uh, my experience, uh, my background experience and degrees in civil and environmental engineering supported me to develop and to hand over better projects to the communities and to the people in need. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mina. Very, very inspirational. And I really like how you connected the, the STEAM profiles and your background in, in that context to, th to the greater work uh, of the UN and, and how we try to, to, to sustain development uh, in, on the ground. So it was very inspirational, actually. And, and it also leads quite nicely to the next question, which maybe I could ask Jody this time, um, which is uh, related, Jody, to your, to your current role today. How would you say it does relate to the development agenda that, that uh, Muna actually also touched upon uh, just a second ago? Over to you. Uh, thanks, yeah. So um, what we do in isotope hydrology is that we look at the isotopes of the water molecule and we use them to create what we call a fingerprint, the isotopic fingerprint of the water molecule. And we can use that to track the movement of individual water molecules through the water cycle. It helps us to understand how much water is available, where it is, how long it will last, what sort of quality it has. And these are really important um, pieces of information that people like Muna need to know when they're trying to supply water to cities who are well established, but also to people who are on the move in refugee camps or um, uh, um, in times of crisis. Um, and so that's what we do. And, and this helps um, people throughout the world to better structure their water security. Um, and that feeds very nicely into the UN because what the UN does is it uses what's called the Sustainable Development Goals to guide the actions that all of the UN partners um, undertake. And there is a specific Sustainable Development Goal for water, which is SDG 6, clean water and sanitation. And that's really where our work sits. We work with providing the information that planners, that um, countries, that governments need in order to manage their water sustainably and effectively into the future. I mean, once again, uh, thank you so much, Judy, and once again for, for also bringing, bringing the bigger context of, of the Sustainable Development Goals, which are the, the roadmap of the United Nations uh, development activities. And it's so interesting to hear how your work um, has a direct implication and, 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 and correlation with MUNA's activities. Uh, and, and, and this really shows the uh, inter interconnection between all these activities here. Yeah. Thank you so one, much one, for that. One thing I might just add quickly is um, a lot of people with the International Atomic Energy Agency, they know of it as the nuclear watchdog. And something that's important to realise is that nuclear sciences, which is what the IAEA is about, is more than just nuclear um, activities in the sense that people think of normally. We Anything that is involving a process that occurs at an atomic scale is a nuclear process. And so isotope hydrology is a nuclear science. Um, and that's something that's very important for people to realise that, that nuclear sciences do a lot of really good work for the whole of the planet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jodie. No, very, very good. Uh, we actually still have a few minutes uh, before moving into the question and answers. And I would like to ask maybe something a bit even more personal uh, than what you've been sharing, all of you, uh, till now. And maybe, Muna, maybe I could ask you, um, uh, what was the best moment of your entire career? <laughs> actually, I was hoping that you will ask me this question, really. This April, I, I turned 60 years old with a long working experience and I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And I really wanted to tell you about the best moment in my professional life, which is not one, which are many. For example, working in the field, especially in the engineering, in construction, in providing people with needed infrastructure, every moment you hand over a project and this project under operation and in use for all the people, it's a best moment. I would like to mention here that we, the engineers or any profession working in construction, every project is our project. 
the one who's doing painting for a school, he will tell his friends and his children, this is my project. The designer will say, this is my project. The constructor and the contractor will say, this is my project. So you always feel that in every project you provide, there is always a best moment. Working in academia, every professor in the graduation day, it will say, this is my best moment. Attending so many graduation ceremonies for my students, it was my best, best, best moment seeing my students in that day. Working in science and research, every time you see a published paper, it is your best moment. Last time I was browsing the internet and I saw a paper just published, published recently in 2022 and I saw my name referenced in a paper I published in 2008. And still the people value this paper and they think that it is the base of the science. It is one of the best moments. But my best, best, best moment is when we handed over a solar compact units, solar lights, the compact units in a refugee camp in Erbil. That was in 2016. And a little girl came to me and said, thank you so much. Now I can go to the washroom in the night. That was my best moment. We at the UN, when we see the impact and the reflection of the projects we are implementing to the refugees, to the people in need, this is the best moment. That girl, since 2016, I will never forget her face when she said, I can go to the washroom now in the night. Thank you so much for asking this question, but mm -hmm. really there are so many best moments for us working at United Nations. Thank you. Thank you, Muna. And, and, and it's, it's actually, again, very humbling what you've just said, because at the end of the day, all our work is towards the beneficiaries and who is more at need than a, than a small small girl uh, in, a, in a remote area and, and poor area. Thank you so much for that. Um, we still have a couple of minutes before coming into the, the Q&A session. And maybe I would like to ask all of you uh, in, in, in a really in one sentence, uh, less than like 30 seconds or, or 40 seconds, uh, what would be your biggest takeaway or advice for potential job candidates listening right now and potentially interested in, in applying for a STEAM position in the UN system? Shall we start with you, Jody, this time? Yeah, I, I would say the need to believe in yourself. I think too many women don't apply because they think that they won't get it. Um, and it's important to really to go out there and to reach for the things that you think are unattainable, um, to believe in yourself and to really go for it and make the opportunities happen for yourself. Well, and sweet. Thank you so much, Jodie. Shall we ask, uh, well, Muna, maybe, if you, can, if you can also share a piece of advice. Yes. Please always think outside the box. Please always think about things that you can add value, health and safety, uh, gender improvement, uh, uh, risk management, um, uh, optimization of resources. We all get our education from the universities the same way, but how we can improve our outputs, uh, how we can add value to the communities, always think and always integrate all uh, uh, types of fields together in order to get an improved output to the people in need and to the communities. Always think outside the box and nothing is impossible. Still, your life is ahead and you only started, but life is, will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Muna. Thank you so much. And last but not least, uh, Ilham, if you want. Thank you very much, Jolik. Uh, I will just say a few sentences that I, I really apply in my life. I always apply it and I still do until the end. Um, don't try to be perfect and then uh, submit or, or do anything. There, take the opportunities 
and own them. Think big. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Very, uh, very uh, motivational, that, that one indeed. And actually, we're going to go into the Q&As uh, from questions from the, the participants uh, in the event. And, and actually, some of these questions relate to the tips the three of you have just uh, mentioned, so maybe into a bit more details. We're right on time. We've, we've been uh, 25 minutes in the panel discussion. And now we will have 20 more minutes, uh, 15, 20 minutes to, to take some Q&As from the uh, participants. One of them I can already answer because some participants have asked if the session was recorded. And, and the answer is yes, the session is recorded and will be made available on the YouTube channels of uh, UNV, but also UNICEF, um, United Nations Development Programme and the UN Secretariat, the UN Careers um, uh, channel, uh, YouTube channel. So at least on these four YouTube channels and maybe more agencies as, as well. So you will be able to refer to it and, and also share it with, with, um, with, other, with other friends or, or colleagues or whoever you would like to share it with. Very good. So um, let me take a few questions from the, um, from the uh, public then. And whoever wants to answer the question I'm going to ask, we just just raise your hand or open your mic. We will only have, ha, ask for one, uh, usually depending, but one person answering the, the question. Um, maybe let's start maybe with some questions about people transitioning. We have had quite a few questions related to um, uh, graduates who are uh, re both in mid-career, but also uh, who, who, who are transitioning. Um, from the private industry, for example, and who would like to work in international organizations like the UN, what tips would you would you share with with such uh, profiles from the private sector transitioning to the UN system? Whoever wants to to take up can open the mic. I can take this from my experience. Uh, really, I think transitioning from the private sector to uh, back to academia is something really, really very useful. I'll give you an example. When I used to work in the field, for example, in water projects, we used to design the water network, let's say, with a slope of 2%. And when the engineers will ask us, why do you do that? For example, we say, oh, this is the norm. This is how we were taught to design it for 2%. But going back from that private sector to academia again, you understand that this 2% or 3% that we use to design for, it's not just haphazardly uh, identified. It is because there are certain models for, let's say, as my dear Judy said, for example, our scientific background will connect together. For example, if you have some sediment, which is the small, smallest particle, to not to settle or to settle needs 2% of the water network. So really it gives you strength. Coming from the uh, private sector back to the scientific uh, uh, studies, will, you will know and appreciate what did you used to know and why. And the models behind that, you will understand it more. You will benefit your colleagues, you'll benefit yourself and finding out answers for things you used to do for granted, but it has scientific background. So yes, go ahead, uh, use your uh, private sector background, going back to the science and then connect them together in order to have better understanding and strength from inside. Thank you, Muna. Uh, if Ilam and Jody want to add, or otherwise we can we can move to the next question. By all means. Yeah, yes, very very briefly. I mean, um, from the ITO, the International Telecommunication Union. I mean, as it sounds, it's telecommunication, is radio communication. We deal with um, the uh, frequency, radio communication frequency spectrum, and satellite orbit. So, um, in general, the recruitments uh, for the technical uh, field uh, for the radio communication sector is mostly from the regulators because we maintain and we apply the radio regulations, etc. But the private, the people coming from private sector are also a very important element because um, they can deal with more technical and uh, deep technical questions 
So um, if you have the right profile, uh, we would be very happy to to have them. And also, um, I mean, the job vacancies are, are um, how to say, continuously uh, updated and we have offers. So please, if you see that you have the right profile, do not hesitate. Whatever background you have, private, uh, regulatory, government, uh, as, as, as far as um, your experience and uh, diplomats, they uh, respond to that. So again, there and submit. Thank you. Oh, actually, I was not muted. Thank you so much, Ilam. Uh, that's that's actually very very good, and it and it fits quite well into another questions or a series of questions we received about applying because it's one thing to have the right experience or, or to be willing to contribute, but there's also the ap application phase. And maybe if I can ask one of you, what does make a CV stand out among all the hundreds of applicants that that would apply for a position? When, when you recruit for your respective units, maybe, uh, what, what, what would make a CV stand out? Yeah, if I might maybe. jump in there, um, I, I'm actually, um, we have a number of uh, recruitment processes going on at the moment. And I think it's important for applicants to understand the difference between the parts of their CV that are box ticking exercises. Do you have a certain number of years of experience? Do you have a certain educational level? These are these are criteria often that will be gateposts, for example. They're, they're, because, because the UN is an international system, there are certain criteria that are, that are box ticking. Do you have these qualities? Okay, yes, you've got them, you pass the first hurdle. So in that sense, it's important to, it's important to apply, like we've said, but it's important to also be realistic. You need to make sure that you meet that first criteria. But once you get there, in my experience, one of the, the key ways of differentiating applicants is in the letter part of the, the application, that, that letter that they write that explains why they think that they are suitable for the position. And I have seen everything from three sentences saying, I, I would like to apply, can I get the job, <laughs> to you know, full essays that I have to plow my way through. So it's important, I think, to really put a lot of work into that letter to also spell check it, grammar check it, um, to make sure that it's um, it's written as well as it can be because a lot of what we do at the UN is writing reports, is writing um, pieces of information or fact sheets that go out to uh, members of the UN community. And then um, to... to really understand what the role is that you're applying for, the position that is you, that you are applying for, and to make sure that your letter talks to that position. It doesn't go on and on about things that are not relevant to the position. This is what I see a lot, that somebody says, oh, well, I'm really good in this, so you must appoint me for that, even though there's no relationship between this and that. Um, in isotope hydrology, we need people who are isotope hydrologists. So there's a lot of people who apply with isotope backgrounds but have no knowledge of isotope hydrology, and those people are not employable by us. So it's important to read the job positions carefully, make sure that you match the criteria, and then focus very strongly on your letter. But having said that, the UN is a very wide agency with a wide range of skills required in the different types of agencies. And there is something for everybody. It's just a matter of finding the position that matches your qualifications and your experience. Uh, Jody, thank you so much for this very clear answer. And if, you, if you're one day um, uh, bored with isotope uh, hydrology, you can become an, an outreach and HR officer because you've nailed it really. Uh, and it has a lot, uh, we can sometimes we summarize it by saying, it's not about you, it's about the job when you apply for a position. So don't try to present yourself uh, holistically, but, but, but focus on the position and how you, you match that position. Thank you so very much. Very, very good, uh, very interesting. Um, maybe I can, we still have a, a few minutes. Maybe I could, um, um, take a question which which we received which is related to gaining field experience um 
oftentimes the UN will require that field, that knowledge of field experience of, of working in a developing country in particular. And it's not always easy to gain that first experience, especially for people who are recently graduated. So uh, maybe Ilam, I can ask you, um, how do you think, what would you say uh, is uh, the best way to gain that field experience or one way? Um, thank you very much for that question. Well, I mean, um, in the UN system, we have a great and uh, the grades, they depend on the years of the experience. So um, the uh, newly graduate, they also have their chances, but they will not have uh, grade three or four or five. So it depends on the years of experience. So for example, uh, the grade one, uh, it doesn't necessarily need uh, experience in, in, in the field. I mean, I'm, I'm again speaking about the, the, the ITU. So they can start there or if, if they have another experiences, then according to the years of experience and the kind of the experience, and again, matching the post, this is very important, and not uh, submitting uh, generic uh, CVs, this is very important, and uh, Jody uh, mentioned that very well. I am also an alternate in the appointment board of the ITU, so we see all kinds, and people, they need to know that there are steps for selections. That's why uh, I saw many uh, questions like, why does it take so long? Because we have different steps and we we take, uh, I mean, we, we pay um, a big attention to every uh, submission. So uh, it depends uh, on the post you are submitting and look uh, at the years of experience. And sometimes there are some relaxations. So for example, uh, we um, require seven years of experience, but if you have a PhD, it counts for two years, for example. So this is very important to match these kinds. We have also other um, relaxations uh, as for language, for example, for developing countries, we can uh, agree and it is written that uh, developing countries only one official language is fine, while for the others, they need to have two, for example. And also for ladies, just to, to add and, and to motivate, uh, uh, again, the ladies, because I think this is one of the our, our, our main uh, objective today, uh, I mean, is that there is also a relaxation. For example, in ITU, when we have the um, same level, uh, a male and a female candidates, it is recommended really to take the, and all of this is written in the job vacancies. It's not a secret, it's very transparent. So uh, again, uh, I think that we, the opportunities are there for everyone. The ones for experience and the ones that are beginners, it's except that, of course, as everywhere, the grade uh, will change. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ilam. And indeed, again, it, it, it brings back uh, that, that importance to read carefully the job description, to make sure you apply for positions where you, you, tick, you tick the must-have requirement boxes, because otherwise, you will not be you you would not be considered so it's a very good point for field experience i can also add that it is a ngo non-governmental organization for example are a great way to gain a very valuable experience we don't necessarily need uh, big names uh, it can be a small private consulting firm working on a engineering project in the middle of nowhere this is as valuable as a bigger company name what we look for is, is, is whether you, you, you have gained that understanding of the context we operate under. Um, building on Elam's comments on the women uh, uh, opportunities in the UN, uh, there were also some questions related to talent with disabilities and, and how do we offer job opportunities for this talent segment of the population. And just to confirm that each agency, each UN organization may have a slightly different uh, policy around this, but we have one thing in common, which is encouraging people with disabilities to apply for positions. And we also encourage you actually to mention while applying, if you have a, spe a specific um, uh, disability, which would require what we call specific accommodation. Because if we don't know about it, we do not we, we, we will not be uh, ready and equipped to, to address whatever specific needs you, you may have. But we strongly encourage people with disabilities to, to apply for UN positions. And it, it, is, it has become a very important part of the agenda of inclusion and diversity, which the UN is, is trying to implement. 
So don't feel shy of not mentioning your disability or not applying, thinking you will not be considered. It's actually the other way around. We really want to, to promote talent with disability among uh, our, our, our staff and our workforce. I'm afraid time is soon up. We're reaching the 45 minute uh, timer. Um, so we cannot take more questions uh, from the public, but maybe if I can turn again my, my head towards our three panelists um, before thanking you, just if you have one last word or tip or advice or piece of advice or whatever you would like to, men to mention to our participants today, uh, the floor is yours again. Mm, I, I would just like to say, if I might, um, for those uh, people who are particularly young people who are interested in coming and working for the UN and I can speak for the International Atomic Energy Agency um, we have the we can have um, interns um, here at the agency um, and that's a really great way of getting to know the agency um, and this part of the UN system and how it works and to provide you with contacts which might um, help you get um, a different a permanent, more permanent position or a, a, a fixed term position um, down the track. So um, anybody who is interested in working, for example, for the International Atomic Energy Agency, I would recommend looking at the internship um, program um, to get your first leg on the uh, foot on the, the ladder, shall we say. Thank you, Jody. Thank you so much. Muna? Yeah, and from my side also, I would like to encourage all of you to approach UNOPS. We have several modalities. We have the retainer modality. So if you have something specific that you can add value, you can start as a retainer, and that will give you the experience, the training. And also we have the internship opportunities. Just be patient. Try to uh, be always brave to approach, and uh, good luck to all. And to educate yourself in new models like, you know, for example, health and safety is very important to UNOPS. I will encourage you to do that. Also, inclusion, as you said, uh, dear Jean, uh, uh, we are also very flexible. So please approach UNOPS anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very good. Ilham, one last word of, of wisdom. I don't have much uh, left uh, after Jody and Muna, so thank you very much. Same thing for ITU. And please, it is important to know that the ITU is not only for engineers. We need HR people, we need uh, social people, we need a lot of things. We have also, um, I mean, uh, offices outside Geneva, it's not only in Switzerland. Uh, we also offer internships. So please go visit uh, the UN family websites. You will find at any opportunity. And again, there, take the opportunity and go for it. If I had to do it all over again, I'll do it the same way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ilam. And, and it's time now to close the, the panel discussion and, and the questions and answers. But I think I would like to thank you on behalf of, of the whole uh, participants very much for, for your wisdom and, your, and also your passion, because there's one, one thing which also resonates here is the passion to make a difference. And, and thank you so much for that. And indeed, there are many different profiles in the UN system. And as I mentioned earlier, we will continue these sessions. Today it was on STEAM profiles, but we will continue in the, in the coming months with, with the more panel discussions on different types of profiles the UN system is looking for. Uh, one last word, um, also just to confirm that not only these sessions have been recorded and uh, available uh, on the um, uh, YouTube channels, uh, but they will also, it will also be made available on the LinkedIn uh, channel of UNV. Uh, that's what I've just been, been informed. We now have to stop. So once again, thank you so very much to the panelists and thank you also so very much to all participants wherever you are on this planet. Thank you for being with us and being willing to, to accompany us in that journey to make a difference uh, for, 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 the pub, for the population and for our planet. Thank you very much and we will be in touch again in the near future. All the very thank best. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Good luck Goodbye. to everyone. Bye. Volunteering is giving, sharing, standing by others, supporting causes you care about, and creating a better future for everyone. This is why more and more entities support volunteering to achieve the sustainable development goals. Volunteers make a difference to the lives of many. Join us and become a United Nations volunteer.